New technology may stop you from taking photos and videos at concerts. Apple has been granted a patent that would let the company disable an iPhone's capturing capabilities. Here to explain is CNET senior editor Dan Ackerman. Dan the man, good to see you. Good to see you guys. So how would this technology even work? Well, what it would do is if you had a certain type of infrared emitter in your venue, let's say a concert venue or something like that, you could turn it on. It would send out a signal and then a compatible iPhone would see that signal and basically shut down the ability to either take a picture, record video or some combination thereof. Uh, it gives you as a venue owner or somebody controlling a space the ability uh, to stop people from recording what happens there. Huh, First Amendment? I don't know. So how likely is it we'll see this implemented into Apple software? You know, one of my favorite things to do, and a lot of other people, is to just keep an eye on all these crazy patents that Apple files and other companies, but a lot of good ones from Apple. Frankly, chances are we're not going to see this in a shipping product. Uh, everyone has their favorite never-released Apple patents from years ago. Uh, my favorite was when they turned the whole bottom of a laptop into a giant touchpad, but taught it how to reject your palm so, so it could tell <laughs> when you were typing and when you wanted to use it. Yeah. I, I think it's just something they've invented, uh, but the, the, the problems behind it are so numerous. Like, what if you turned it on at a political rally or a speech so nobody could record what the candidate was saying. I, well, I find it the very police, difficult. Yeah, I, you know, it seems to me like, I mean, I get the idea that artists want people to enjoy the experience, although I feel like we've gone so far beyond that now. But as you point out, there's some serious questions. If you're at a political rally, if you're watching some kind of police in, interaction with citizens and you want to be able to shoot that, if they have some kind of technology that disables cameras, it could be very tricky. Oh, yeah, you can see people abusing this all over the place, but if you're a big technology company, you invent something, it's in your interest to at least get it on paper to say that you own the idea. For sure. All right, driverless cars now are moving closer toward mainstream reality, and while they may improve safety, they raise a whole lot of questions. As you know, Dan, there's a new study published in Science Magazine that asks about a scenario where, faced with the decision to sacrifice one passenger or kill 10 pedestrians, explain what the study found. Yeah, this is a question that people have actually been asking for a long time. It's one of a great series of questions that the concept of autonomous cars brings up. Who are you supposed to protect? Are you supposed to protect the driver, or are you supposed to protect uh, property or, or civilians, you know, pedestrians who are walking? And that's one of those nightmare scenarios you can present to somebody. The car may have to decide, do I save the life of the driver, or do I save the life of a pedestrian? And I don't think we have either a legal or really an ethical answer for that yet, because it's such a new area. Who decides how to program the ethics into these cars? Oh, clearly that's it's not going to be a very Plato-like or Aristotle-like person. <laughs> and, and does it always favor one or the other, or does it do a complex calculation of variables and who decides how much one variable is worth versus another? I mean, driverless cars, autonomous cars, I think it's a much deeper issue than just getting them to stay on the road. There are so many issues that, that the law, that insurance companies, uh, that everybody is just going to have to start dealing with, and it's going to take years to sort it out. All right, let me ask you about this. Facebook is changing the way stories come into your news feed. What factors now will determine the priority of these posts? Well, the, the new update from Facebook, they are now saying that we know you see a lot of stories from different publications, maybe from us, uh, but maybe you're not seeing as many from your friends and your family, and maybe you're losing touch with what Facebook was originally about, connecting you uh, to your friends. So now they're going to, to push those posts further up and emphasize things from friends, things from family, things of a personal nature, and de-emphasize, to some degree at least, published news articles, which is a big deal because a lot of people in the in the news and the content business have come to rely on Facebook as a platform. But I'm looking at, we have on our screen right now for our viewers to see the factors that determine the post priority. One of them is your feed should entertain. Uh, how does it know, I mean, I'm entertained by a lot of weird things, so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I bet you're going to keep seeing a lot of those weird things. Uh, you know, if a post gets a lot of likes, that helps you. Uh, if it gets a lot of views and maybe not a lot of likes, that just may mean it's controversial, but you don't agree with it, you may see that also just because it's very relevant. Uh, it's almost like the Google search engine algorithm. They're always changing it. You're never going to know the exact secret formula, but there are a ton of consultants and experts out there who, who are trying to tell people that they can figure it out and kind of sell you their services. Yeah, because the last thing I would want is, for example, I love Marlon Brando's movie The Wild One, I wouldn't want the Fast and the Furious like promo to show up in my feed because I wouldn't care. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Give me Brando anytime. <laughs> Dan Ackerman, thanks so much as always. Thank you.